Hello, everybody. I think uh, because I'm a couple of minutes late, uh, we can probably kick off and people have had a bit of time to to join. So welcome, everyone, to our second in our series of BHF Data Science Centre uh, monthly seminars um, being presented as webinars for obvious reasons. Um, it's very nice to see everybody. Uh, I will be surveying who's here well during the first talk because I haven't had a chance to do that as yet. But anyway, um, it, uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce um, two talks today. So um, the first of those is going to come from the BHF Data Science Centre team, um, and they're going to give an update um, across our portfolio of work, focusing on some of the new areas of work, um, and um, also talking a little bit about our communications and patient and public involvement programme. And then uh, second up, we have a guest speaker today, um, Seamus Kent from NICE, um, who's going to talk to us about their methods and standards programme for data and analytics. Uh, for those of you involved in the CVD COVID UK consortium, you'll be aware that um, NICE are represented in that consortium and um, have been quite involved in thinking about some of the projects and ways in which they might use the data um, uh, in the various trusted research environments, um, in particular um, in England, because that's uh, an important part of their patch, as it were. So we really look forward to hearing from Seamus um, in the second half of our seminar today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the BHF Data Science Centre um, and ask them to tell us all about what's going on. Thanks very much, Cathy. So um, I'm just going to give a very brief overview about the BHF Data Science Centre, then I'll hand over to Jackie, who will uh, discuss more of the new areas of work that, that we've just started, and then Debbie, who's a comms and engagement manager, who will talk around communications and patient public involvement. So next slide, please, Jackie. Uh, so um, I'm sure a lot of you know, but the BHF Data Science Centre is a partnership between Health Data Research UK and uh, the British Heart Foundation. And the centre itself is embedded within HDI UK. It launched uh, just over a year ago on the 1st of January 2020 when uh, Kathy took her post as director uh, and we've been slowly building the team since then. Um, we have an initial investment of 10 million um, from the BHF over the first five years and uh, we are looking to, we have the ambition to grow that. Um, and we work closely with a, a wide range of stakeholders, some of which are uh, listed on this slide. And it's about, it's not just about um, promoting safe and ethical use of data for research, but actually facilitating and enabling that, um, with, particularly for the cardiovascular community. Um, and so our, our vision is, is very much, we are the cardiovascular wing of HDI UK. So it's about um, improving the health of the cardiovascular health of the nation by using uh, large scale data and applied analytics. So next slide, please. So this is our team. Um, so at the top is Lydia Martin, who uh, is Kathy's EA, but also provides a huge amount of project management support and administration and keeps us all organised. Uh, Debbie is a, a communications and engagement manager, and you'll hear from her later. Reuven, I'm sure a lot of you know already, he's a research project manager, and particularly on um, CBD COVID UK. <laughs> it's a particularly terrible picture of the operations director too. Um, so, and then Jackie, who you'll hear from in a minute, she's uh, talking about some of the work she's been doing around uh, clinical trials and personal monitoring. And then last but not least, our leader, Cathy. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just a, a, what we call the Wheel of Fortune, which is our wheel of um, activity, sort of thematic areas and, and cross-cutting activity that, that we do within the BHF Data Science Centre. So the, the six segments that you see um, are the uh, thematic uh, areas or work streams. And the first one is uh, structured data. So this is about uh, improving access, uh, sort of quality uh, linkage and better use of structured data. So these are things like uh, electronic health records. So those of you that work on the CBCOM UK project, this is where, that's where that project sits under that particular thematic area. And so those that don't know about CBD Comic UK, I'm not necessarily going to talk about that today, but it's about um, linking routinely collected population-wide uh, health data to look at, um, and making that available in trusted research environments to look at the relationship between 
cardiovascular disease and uh, COVID-19. Um, and you can find more information about this on our website. There'll be links at the end of this talk. Um, and there were a couple of talks last in the last webinar that um, discussed some of this, and they'll soon be available on our YouTube site. Um, so you can find out more there. And the next webinar will actually have more information on that as well. Uh, the second segment is unstructured data. So doing something very similar to what I've discussed with uh, structured data, but unstructured, I mean things like imaging data, pretext, or um, sort of electrocardiograms, things like that. Personal monitoring data is a particular type of unstructured data. So looking at things like apps and wearables and linking that to other types of healthcare data. So you can start to look at uh, disease trajectories and also management of, of disease. Uh, computable phenotypes is the, the fourth one, and that's uh, representing uh, cardiovascular health and disease in machine-readable formats, and then developing tools and protocols for the uh, community to, to share and use, reuse. Um, the next is around population and disease-based cohorts. So that's looking at uh, various cohorts, and again, linking them with other types of um, healthcare data, such as the routinely collected healthcare data, so that we can start to understand the causes of disease, but also start to look at uh, personalised strategies of um, treatment and uh, prevention. And then finally, um, it's data-enabled clinical trials. So this is looking at using routinely collected healthcare data to um, make um, to streamline and make more efficient uh, clinical trials. So whether this is in the sort of planning and recruitment phase, or actually more of the outcomes and follow-up. Um, so those are our sort of six themes um, of work. And then in the blob in the middle is the coordination and engagement, which is a, one of our cross-cutting activities, which provides the leadership, the project management, the support and comms and engagement to, to glue all of that together. Um, around the outside, we have uh, driver projects, which, um, so exemplar or driver projects, these are the sort of things like the CVCOV UK project that will actually drive the progress within these different thematic areas. Um, and then the grey arrow, which isn't labelled, is our talent and training programme. So we have a budget for, to fund a couple of PhD students and also some research fellows um, to actually work in uh, health data science within the cardiovascular space. Um, and we actually will partner with others, uh, which we are looking to do with the PhD studentships initially, uh, so that they form a large uh, part of a large cohort within the health data science space. Uh, so that's a very whistle-stop tour about um, the over, the, what's going on within the BHF Data Science Centre, and I'll hand over to Jackie to talk specifically about a couple of areas that she's been working on. Sorry, it's just stopped. I just froze in there. Okay. Um, so I think you can see the personal monitoring data um, slide. So we've just started doing some work in this area. Um, so personal monitoring data, data, as Lynn mentioned, is data um, from wearables such as Fitbit and um, Apple Watch and apps. It represents a huge wealth of unexposed um, information, which if available um, linked to health records could help advance understanding into the causes and consequences of cardiovascular di disease. However, um, as, I as I'm sure you can imagine, there's um, a huge amount of challenges associated with accessing and linking to this data, such as privacy concerns, establishing consent, data storage and access, and linkage to health data sets. Our aim in this area is to create a population scale wearables data set with linkage to health data. So to start off our work in this area, um, we're beginning with um, organising an initial scoping workshop, which will bring together experts in the field, along with other key stakeholders. This will be a small interactive workshop to discuss the opportunities and challenge, challenges associated with creating this um, linked data set. Um, so coming out of this workshop, we're hoping to define some next steps and we'll then be following up with additional work to solicit um, input from the wider community. We'll also be advertising for a lead in this area in the next couple of weeks. Another area that we just started looking at is um, data-enabled clinical trials. Um, so um, in the organisation and follow-up clinical trials, the use of routinely collected healthcare data 
um, could um, deliver more efficient and cost-effective trials. However, there are sort of challenges associated with, you, with using this type of data. Our aim in this area is to streamline the use of routinely collected healthcare data for trial planning, recruitment, or follow-up. Um, so to um, start off the work in this area and help us prioritize how we can best use our resources to help users of this data, we're in investigating the use of this data um, to identify the challenges that users face. And we've carried out a survey um, which we um, set, sent out, we emailed directly to contacts at, at clinical trials units. It's also distributed via mailing lists and newsletters to professional group, groups and via Twitter. It just ended um, earlier this week, so we're just looking at the um, preliminary results now. We have 56 responses. Um, 35 of these individuals had used um, routinely collected healthcare data in cardiovascular clinical trials. And you can see in the plot on the right, um, these are issues that were identified as presenting a considerable challenge to the use of routinely collected data by respondents to this survey. Um, and there were 25 people that responded to this question. So you can see in the plot that the main challenges were the um, ease of data access, timely data access, and data availability. And in particular, when you look at the detail that um, respondents provided, um, they cited um, um, complicated um, and time-consuming um, approvals process, um, government governance, and delays in accessing data. So we'll be going through the survey results in more detail. Um, we also interviewed for a lead in this area yesterday, so hopefully we'll have some news on that soon. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Debbie, who's going to um, run through our public engagement and communications. Thanks, Jackie. Um, yes, so I look after um, communications, engagement and um, patient and public involvement for the BHF Data Science Centre. Um, and you can see on the bottom of this slide, so our, our kind of vision around uh, patient and public involvement engagement is around kind of really trying to work um, in a partnership um, with patients and the public to really ensure that the, that the patient role work is fully embedded across the key areas of, of the work of the BHF Data Science Centre. Um, so at the moment, I'm finalising um, a comms and engagement strategy, which will have um, a significant component of patient involvement, which will be going to our um, current lay members for their feedback before um, continuing further. But you can see on this, um, this, this slide, using the same um, wheel that you saw earlier, we've currently um, got four lay members um, recruited who are part of the Approvals and Oversight Board for the CVD COVID UK Consortium. Um, and they have been very supportive in um, sort of looking over project proposals, uh, supporting lay summaries, um, providing lay commentary pieces. Um, and the, the kind of asks for that group are starting to increase. So we're really looking at how to, how to best um, continue to support that area of our work. We also have one lay member recruited um, who forms part of our governance, so sits um, on the Centre Oversight Committee um, offering um, patient involvement and um, oversight and support um, right at the heart of what we do. Come to the next slide, please. Um, so then coming up next, we're really looking at, um, so um, personal monitoring was something that was mentioned um, earlier. So our next plan stages for, for patient public involvement is seeking to recruit some lay members who will be able to specifically support the work that's beginning around personal monitoring data. Um, and also we've been trying to map out um, our patient involvement and engagement work across each of the segments in the wheel. So one of the things we'll be discussing with our lay members is around the potential for having a wider patient panel, potentially with, with individuals aligned to different aspects of our, of our key work streams to ensure that we're really supporting each of those areas as best we can with that work. Um, and also one of the things that I'll be considering is the ways that we can um, encourage and support um, patient involvement work beyond a more traditional panel model. So which areas of our work um, will be appropriate to have focus groups, to have email surveys, to potentially capture a wider span of voices um, of people to be able to dip in and out and have ad hoc involvement with the centre based around um, the capacity and um, needs of our patient members. Next slide, please, Jackie. 
So one of the things that would be, be really helpful is I'm trying to map out um, where there is also um, existing PPI support, um, either at host institutions or with local contacts or bespoke patient groups. Um, so if you're aware of any, um, any kind of existing networks or key contacts or supports at your host institution or organisations that you've used before, I'd really appreciate it if you could drop me an email with some details of that so we can really try and build up a good picture of what PPI support there is and that we'll be able to support our work going forwards. And next slide please, Jackie. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a freezing <laughs> issue. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. I'm trying. There you go. <laughs> Thank you for the contact already, Ashley, in the chat. That's really helpful. And then just finally, um, to pick out some examples around the communications work. So again, I'm, I'm sort of working out um, best approaches to really begin our communications um, um, approach for the BHF Data Science Centre. So we launched our, um, our new Twitter account, which is at BHF Data Science um, on the 9th of February. So please do give us a follow um, if you're on Twitter and haven't already. Um, and you can see here with the um, outputs for the descriptive paper from the CBD COVID UK um, consortium, you can really see the kind of reach um, that we've started to, to gather from, from this with examples of um, news on the HDI UK website, um, also from Health Tech News who've picked up on that story as well. So really keen to continue to expand our, our approach and reach with, um, the, with the communications that we do. And next slide please, Jackie. Trying to change my... <laughs> There you go. It's coming through. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to everyone who's already put in contacts in the chat. That's really helpful. Um, and I can see Will's on the call. This is um, just an example of um, how we're really trying to work with partner, um, partner teams who work in communications. So um, from the British Heart Foundation, we have monthly calls with their research comms team to make sure we're really aligning um, the comms that we do overall and, and supporting each other. Um, and here's an example of some funding that was awarded by the Stroke Association. Um, so the comms approach um, for the announcement of this was led by the Stroke Association, very strongly supported by Will, um, who put an awful hu a huge amount of effort into um, providing his time and producing video content to support this coverage. Um, and you can see this was picked up um, with over 300 mil um, and a really strong video um, that Will filmed of himself talking about the work was then edited with a really strong patient story, which then had over 42,000 impressions on social media. So a really lovely example of um, how we can try and support and enhance the work of our comms partners where we can. And final slide, I think, from me, Jackie, if you go. Sorry, my internet connection is unstable. I can preempt it. So, again, yeah. <laughs> so as, as I'd asked for the patient and public involvement contacts, again, we're really trying to broaden our connections with the communications teams that are based within um, host institutions. So, um, so for example, with the, with the previous slide that the team at the Edinburgh University Press team were really supportive. So to try and make sure that I've got a really good picture um, of the comms um, teams and contacts across, um, across the organisations that we work with, again, it would be really helpful if you could drop me an email just with the name and contact email of the comms or media lead at your host institution. Um, just so then I can really start to map out um, where we can we can start to work together and collaborate on that. And also any other kind of media or trade contacts that you might have had um, success with before who've been warm to your research news. Um, that would be really fantastic. So please do drop me an email and I can follow that up. And then the final slide really is just um, highlighting some of the different links for you to find out more um, about our work, including some Twitter email, the website, um, the recent descriptive paper links um, and we'll leave this slide up um, just in, while we take some questions. 